Hi, everybody. Mike Hancock here, and welcome to today's what we call Global Intelligence Update. And, uh, you know, every one of our presenters is a pleasure to have on board, but today is very special um, and very pleasurable for me because Dr. Patrick Louis, he wasn't a doctor when I first met him 14 years ago, I think it was. But Patrick uh, is one of the people I would definitely call a mentor of mine um, at different stages of life. Uh, we've shared stages together over the years. And, uh, you know, for those of you that don't know, he's one of the co-founders and partners in Success Resources, the biggest events company in the world, and the only one to be listed on a stock exchange that I know of. Patrick will correct me if I'm wrong there. And uh, more importantly, I met Patrick when he was the head of HSR, which was really another one of his babies, which if you call it a baby, it was, uh, as I recall at the time, uh, a real estate agency with 6,000 agents and the most successful real estate agency in Singapore. Uh, Patrick is a student, the, an eternal student. Uh, he's a very, very humble man. Um, he's been involved in more business successes, more charities than most people on the planet. And he really, really has a deep wisdom to share. And today he's going to be talking about resilience. So Patrick, without any further ado, uh, really looking forward to, to what you've got to say today. And welcome to the call. Thank you very much, uh, Mike Hancock, for the really kind introduction. After that introduction, I'm dying to hear myself. Okay, <laughs> first of all, I want to thank uh, Mike Hancock, Nicola, Nicola, and all of you for having me on Global Intelligence Update. Now, before I begin, I'd like to share with you a personal life story which changed my life. Imagine with me one evening scene, and that scene will stay in my mind to the last day of my life. Come with me to a living room in a resort in Langkawi, Malaysia. Six of us were sitting around a table and deep in a discussion. There were looks of despair, fear, and helplessness three potent emotions that when mixed together would drive anyone down an emotional spiral. Prior to that moment, I had given everybody a summary of our business strategic and financial positions. The prognosis was not good. In fact, my conclusion was that we had come to the end of the road. Some years before that painful evening, we had founded a technology company during what was known as the dot-com boom. Now at that stage, our startup had big dreams, great promises, and you could say staggering achievements too. Within a short period, we had thousands of customers paying us a decent fee. They came from more than 10 different countries, and that achievement was unprecedented and almost record-breaking. Most dot-com companies at that point were providing freebies while chasing for eyeballs. They also never quite expanded beyond their home and beyond their neighboring countries. We were certainly on a roll. It seems like nothing could stop our technological juggernaut. And then came the dot-com bust or the dot-com crash in year 2001. By then, we had many copycats. Meanwhile, there was a wave of disruptive innovations that turned our radical innovation into a normal proposition. We were facing multiple disruptions on many fronts and throughout the value chain. There were no more roads ahead of us. We were facing untamed jungles and they were looming over us in a hostile way. That night, there wasn't even a single star on site to guide us forward. After my short message, there was a deep, deep silence. It was like an avalanche has suddenly buried us up to our neck with snow. The initial coldness was gradually being, was biting us deeper and deeper into our being. After what seemed like ages, I finally broke the silence. I told everybody we had no other choices. So far, we have invested more than $4 million of our personal money into the company. We can't go on pouring money into a deep, dark, and scary well. Let's just close the company. The proverbial guillotine was released. 
And in this case, our life was not only taken away in the space of a moment because that babe, that company was our baby. It was worse. We felt like that baby was forcibly taken away from us and the sharp blade had cut right through our hearts, our soul, our mind, and our spirits. After that meeting, you could imagine how all of us had walked out of the door and into the darkness of the night. What was even more painful was that we were gradually being swallowed by the darkness in our spirits. The next few days, I was a tormented soul. I couldn't get my brain to face my heart or for that matter, any other parts of my being. And shortly after that, my team and I decided to fight back. We believe we have many more fights left inside of us. We decided not to run away from disruptive forces. Instead, we would take them by the horns. We would beat our way through hostile jungles until we can build a bigger and better road to freedom. Long story short, our company went on to recover our losses. We turned the corner. We stopped the bleeding and became one of the most profitable dot-com companies. Subsequently, we became the seventh fastest growing company in the Asia-Pacific region, occurring, according to Deloitte and Touche. Looking back, I realized the difference between successful people and those who are not successful is very often one word. And that word is resilience. So what is resilience? Resilience to me is the ability to recover from difficulties setbacks or failures and press on to achieve sustainable success. It is one of the hallmarks of leaders and winners in life. What are the critical success factors for resilience? To develop resilience, there are three important critical factors. First, choice. Resilient people realize their limitations. Therefore, they choose their battles. Carefully. These are battles that will make best use of their potential, strength, and resources to achieve optimal results. Second, perseverance. Resilience is not only about bouncing back from a pit or a pitfall in life, it is also about the creativity, ability, agility, and tenacity to persevere until you reach your desired destination. Resilience is not only about having the guts, the grits, and the gumption to do what you want to do. It is also about doing the things that you don't want to do in order to achieve a worthwhile goal. Resilience drives you to persevere despite obstacles, adversity, and other challenges along the way. Resilient people don't just ask, what if I fail? They also ask themselves, what if I don't succeed? They don't just ask, is there a way? They also ask, how can I find a better way? They constantly review themselves by asking, for example, how can I develop a better way or pursue a better destination? Am I willing to sacrifice and change who I am for the sake of who I should be, what I do for the sake of what I should do, and what I have for when what I have for the sake of what I should have to achieve sustainable success. When you press on to develop perseverance, perseverance will help you press on towards success. Third, recovering well. Resilience is not only about recovery, but about how well and how fast you recover from a problem or a setback. What are the principles of resilience? Resilient people adopt seven principles to help them recover well. First, principle of self. 
Brazilian people know that they may not be able to change a setback, but they can change themselves. Second, principle of strategy. Resilient people know that they may not be able to change a setback, but they can certainly change their responses to the setback. Third, principle of support. Resilient people know that they may not be able to change a setback, but they can certainly seek support to help them tackle the challenge. Fourth, principle of solution. Resilient people know that they may not be able to change a setback, but they can certainly find ways to overcome the setback and other ways to achieve better results. Fifthly, principle of significance. Resilient people know that they may not be able to change a setback, but they can discover meaning, lessons, and purpose in the setback. Sixthly, principle of strength. Resilient people know that they may not be able to change a setback, but they can leverage on the challenge to become a stronger, more resilient, and better person. When a setback is too big for them to overcome, resilience compels them to change and grow stronger and bigger than their setbacks so that they are better prepared and better positioned to overcome current and future setbacks. When they press on in pressing on, they will get better in completing the task and finishing the race. Next, principle of shine. Resilient people know that they may not be able to change a setback, but they can certainly from, learn from the challenge to help them reach out to others who are struggling in life. How then can you and I be resilient? Strangely enough, when I did my research on these subjects, I realized we can learn how to be resilient from rats. That's right. We have rats in almost every corner of this planet, in almost every country. Rats have been with us for a very long time, and they can be found in almost every part of the world. Despite all the efforts to exterminate them, they have overcome whatever humans have thrown at them and come back with more. Rats are true survivors. Rats can teach us eight powerful lessons on how to be resilient and how to survive and thrive in a disruptive future. First, rats are adaptable. It has been said that we are living in what many would call a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environment or VUCA environment. As the world continues to change at a much faster pace than ever before, there are few models, if any, to help us navigate through the ever-evolving landscapes. Perhaps the rest can shed some light to show us the way. I read a book by neuroscientist Kelly Lambert. She has conducted many experiments that involve rats for more than 25 years. And this is what she said about rats. She said that rats are the most successful and adaptive mammals on the planet. She found that rats can respond to changes in the environment faster than any other mammals through their adaptive strategies and through their good habits. Rats somehow know that they cannot change the environment, but they can change themselves. They cannot change the situation, but they can change their responses to the situation. They can adapt to whatever circumstances they're in. And in fact, they can grow smarter, more skillful and faster in resolving the challenges around them. And you know what? Humans can also respond to a fast changing world in a similar way too. Second, Rats are self-directed learners or self-regulated learners, and they are teachable. Rats are self-directed learners, and they're constantly looking out, seeking for new lessons. 
They are sensitive to the things around them and they are curious to find out more about these things. And yet at the same time, they're suspicious and they're even paranoid about both the known as well as the unknown. They intuitively know that there's a lesson at every given moment and the next lesson can make a difference to whether they can live and live well through another day. And what's even more exciting is that rats are teachable. They have been trained and deployed to detect all kinds of chemicals, including TNT in landmines, and they can even detect tuberculosis or TB in human saliva. In addition, rats learn not only from their own experiences, they also learn from the experiences of the other rats. For example, if they see another rat being endangered or another rat has lost its life, it can learn from the experience and become more prepared to overcome similar challenges. They learn not only quickly, but they also apply the lessons promptly and skillfully to cope with perpetual onslaught of risk and dangers in their daily lives. Rats are willing to make the necessary changes to survive and thrive in any environment. And perhaps because of their ability to learn and their teachable spirit, rats have developed many qualities to help them capitalize on any situation. They have traditionally been associated with being ambitious, intelligent, creative, honest, skillful, flexible, resourceful, agile, courageous, sociable, and generous. You'll be wondering why I can rattle all these qualities because some of you who understand the Chinese culture will know that uh, one of the years in our lunar calendar is actually uh, dedicated to the rats because of all these wonderful qualities. These qualities have helped rats to survive despite being small and living in complex and hostile environments. In a similar way, we need to constantly upgrade ourselves to help us resolve problems and capitalize on opportunities in the world that we're living in as well as in the world to come. Third, rats are versatile and creative. It may be shocking to you to know that rats can be smarter than humans. I repeat again, rats can even be smarter than humans. I was reading a report published by Harvard Business Review, and one of the studies done by, uh, uh, by uh, the research uh, experts in KU Leuven, uh, one of the laboratory, they put rats and students through two cognitive learning tasks. And they were trained to differentiate between good and bad patterns. And then they were tested on how well they apply these lessons to new types of patterns. For the first test, the rest and students achieved about the same results. But for the second test, rats performed better than the students. One possible explanation is that humans have a tendency to evaluate information based on past experiences. And they have a tendency to stick to status quo. They are conditioned to look for rules and they make judgments based on these rules formed by past experiences. However, when a situation is new, more complex, and there are more variables to consider, it is hard to make judgment based on past rules and past lessons. For example, when a new technology is discovered, there are no hard and fast rules on how to apply the technology or for, mat for a matter, how to apply the technology for different users and in different situations. In such a complex situation, learning has to be based on an integration of information. And in this regard, rats may have an advantage over humans because of their lifestyle and because of their constant struggle to survive in a hostile environment. Rats can go everywhere and anywhere, even if they have to struggle against great odds. 
and go through different situations, including difficult situations to look for food and other essentials. Along the way, they enlarge not only their brain capacity, but they also fill their brains with new spatial knowledge and other information. More importantly, they find different ways to integrate and leverage on information to achieve their desired outcomes. And in a similar way, we have to, as humans, we have to expand our repository of information by cultivating new relationships, new knowledge and new experiences, both within our comfort zones and without. And that's why I'm so excited to be invited in this webinar to know people from all over the world coming together to learn, to share ideas, because that's precisely what we need to do in a world that is not only globalized, that will be increasingly more and more interconnected and interdependent on one another. As we create more dots in our mind, we have to challenge conventional ways of joining the dots and at the same time, find out different ways to join the dots. In doing so, I hope we can formulate a clearer picture and a better pathway forward to our destination or to our chosen destination. Fourth, rats demonstrate a resilient spirit. Research has shown that as rats go through different experiences, the capacity of their brains not only starts to improve, but rats are also able to integrate different lessons that they have learned to become more intelligent and more creative. They constantly improve their abilities to thrive including bouncing back from failures and setbacks. Similarly, studies about the human brain had shown that our cognitive abilities are not set in concrete. A while ago, when I was driving my uh, colleague uh, to our office, I was telling him that our brain is like plasticine. It is malleable. It is neuroplastic. And our skill sets can undergo constant and ongoing changes and improvements. In other words, your brain, my brain, your abilities and my abilities can be strengthened through going, through going and growing through life's experiences, including multiple challenges. On the other hand, when one's life is in a relaxed routine and sedentary uh, manner, one's neural tissues will shrink and it will weaken one's ability to handle the vicissitudes of life. As we learn from challenges and failures, we can strengthen our capacity, ability, agility, and tenacity to overcome failures and achieve more sustainable successes. Fifth, listen to this carefully. Rats love to work. I repeat again, rats love to work. We have heard of the term called the rat race. It probably refers to domesticated rats running stressfully, continuously on a treadmill and going nowhere. But in reality, rats love to work and they find happiness in the process of working. Although they don't work aimlessly, sorry, sorry they don't work aimlessly, they actually work with a mission, with a critical purpose to escape from dangers, forage for food, look for mates, or find shelters, or many other reasons for their survival and uh, to thrive in whatever environment they're in. They also learn how to work hard, work smart, work fast, and work productively to get results. If they are deprived from work, listen very carefully, if they're deprived from work, Rats will suffer from sluggishness, anxiety disorder, and depression. Isn't that also true for many humans? These are some of the millions that we find in many developed countries that are equipped with luxuries to support a sedentary lifestyle. We have to learn from rats in terms of developing a healthy work ethos. To many people, work has taken somewhat of a bad name. Work is perceived to erode happiness and well-being and is at times de deemed to be a burden, a bondage or a baggage. It is said 
Because other than sleeping, you and I are going to spend most parts of our adult life in the workplace. We can and we should build, we can and we should learn to enjoy our work and through our good work, find purpose, happiness, meaning, and fulfillment. In the process of work, we can engage our brains and be involved with physical and other activities to make things happen. These activities can help us prevent dementia and develop our cognitive and emotional abilities to live a healthier life. When you enjoy your work, as I've always said, your work life will become a perpetual vacation. I repeat again, when you enjoy your work, your work life will be a perpetual vacation. And what's even better, you get paid for your enjoyment in the workplace. Six, rats are go-getters. Rats have poor vision. I don't know whether you know this, but fortunately, they seem to carry a no-excuse spirit in their genes. They know what they want and they know how to find what they want. They made up for their poor vision by sharpening their senses of smell, hearing and touch, and especially through their sensitive whiskers. When they enter the room, it is said that rats can momentarily identify hideaways, places to run and climb, paper and fabrics to shred for making beds, chewable items, places to explore, and even tiny objects. It has been said that even in a dark room, rats can find the location of food within 50 thousandth of a second. There is hardly anything that can stop rats from going to any place in the world. According to the essential guide to rats that I read, rats can be found in almost all nooks and corners of the world because they are known to hitch hikes in all kinds of vehicles. If rats can do it, there is no reason, absolutely no reason why we as humans cannot dream and make our dreams come true with the support of the resources available to each and every one of us. Rats can hone their, what we call the reticular activating system or RAS for short. They learn to find and focus on desired vision and a pathway to achieve the vision. Now for those who don't know, just a quick uh, summary, the reticular activating system is a part of the brain's attention center. It is responsible for regulating transition between sleep and wakefulness, including levels of consciousness. In addition, it is also the gatekeeper of thoughts, emotions, and external influences. As a switching center, the RES processes a constant bombardment, bombardment of information that's received through all our five senses. And it sieves out in crucial information. And this information are being transmitted to our conscious mind so as to coordinate integrated responses to external forces or external stimuli. As a result, the RES plays an important part in activating the right focus motivation and action to achieve targeted goals. Besides developing the RES, the good news is that with advancement of technology and other innovations, there are more highways for you to run further and faster to success. In other words, you can develop the RES in your brain to succeed in anything that you put your heart and your mind to. Seven, rats are empathetic. I read a study by a neurologist by the name of Peggy Mason at the University of Chicago. And she found that rats chose to release other rats in a trap cage instead of going for a piece of chocolate in another cage. Can you imagine this? And a study conducted by researchers in Japan shows that rats opted to abandon a piece of chocolate to save another drowning rat. The results of this study suggest that rats can be affected by emotions of other rats and they manifest empathetic and altruistic attitude and behavior. 
Another fascinating study that I read was published in the Journal of eLife. It, showed, it was shown that rats extend such behaviors even to strangers. Humans, I believe, and I like to believe, have a greater sense of empathy than, and, than the altruism that are found in rats. Empathy is one of the most powerful emotions that can influence social learning, communication, and influence. Empathy can help humans to bridge and bond with one another, and it cannot be easily replicated by intelligent machines. I do not believe that technology can replicate or reproduce the empathy that has been created and divinely endowed in each and every one of us. With empathy and intelligent machines helping us, you and I can provide high-tech and high-touch ingredients to win hearts and mind and lead and manage people in a new age. Last but not least, rats, interestingly enough, are sociable and compassionate. Rats are known to be sociable and affectionate. They cherish their friends and they love companionship. What's even interesting is that they possess pro-social behaviors and they look after each other, including the weak, the injured and sick rats among them. Without friends around them, rats tend to become lonely and even depressed. There was a study done in Lisbon and the study shows that rats, rats chose to share a pallet of food with another rat instead of having a pallet of food for themselves. In the same study, the, the rat that was tested would share food 70% of the time and 14 of the 15 rats would share the food with other rats. If rats can exhibit selfless, caring, and compassionate spirits, there's absolutely no reason why, as humans, we cannot do much more and do much better for the people and the environments around us. Humans have one of the most powerful forces available to us. And that force is called love. Unfortunately, in the process of a busy lifestyle, you and I probably have barely scratched the surface of love and to tap this awesome and this powerful force. The paradoxical truth is this, the more you and I extend our love to others, the stronger will be our capacity and capability to love them. You and I have more love for ourselves as well as more than in love, love to share with others. Love is appealing and even infectious. It can draw others to you and me. At the same time, it can spur you to improve yourself and be a blessing to others. By being loving, you can inspire others to live out and flourish through the power of love. When you and I show more compassion, kindness and generosity to others, you can also increase your level of happiness and well-being. Love can work miracles on the people and the environment around us. And love is a key ingredient to making the world a better home. I hope as you continue your journey in life, just like the best of rats, may you continue to learn and develop the requisite discipline, skills, and systems to capitalize on the fast-changing environment. Work hard to leverage on the best of technologies and other resources to create a positive impact on the world around you. Along the way, look after your loved ones and look after the people around you as you create a brighter and better future for humanity. Let me conclude by saying this. Resilient people believe that success belongs to those who never give up. Success is just, sorry, success is, or as my friend would say, sorry, 
my, my good friend Richard Tan will always say this. I'm trying to remember what he said now. Success, he said, is a long corner, but it is just around the corner. They choose the journey, persevere through challenges, recover from failures, and rise up stronger and better to finish the course. Throughout history, resilient people create some of the most inspiring stories to impact and inspire lives and change destinies. My friend, you can be the next inspirational stories to exemplify how resilience has helped you to achieve success. And in doing so, I hope you will motivate many others to achieve their own successes. Thank you for listening to my webinar. I'm ready to answer any questions if you have. Thank you. Patrick, thank you so much. And uh, maybe if you could just stop the, the screen share in a second, everybody grab a screenshot of that if you want to connect with Patrick before we move on and, uh, and just make sure you've got that so you can connect with him in, in the various ways on Facebook or on his YouTube channel as well. So <clears throat> Patrick, I've got a couple just of questions. Just to clarify, we'll... uh, my YouTube channel is Strictly Educational uh, and also be my uh, Facebook friend because uh, I'm at a stage in my life where uh, if I can inspire one more person today, I am a more fulfilled person. So I make it a point to uh, post a an educational article every day. So every day I'll write an educational article first to educate myself and then hopefully it will impact other people. Uh, I don't advertise any products and services. So please uh, join me so that we can walk on this journey of life together. Thank you. Yes, very good. And uh, actually some of your posts uh, that I've read over the last year are just, uh, just fantastic. So I'd recommend everybody goes there. I'm interested, Patrick, in, you know, I loved a lot of the rat stuff. I mean, uh, it, was, it was really phenomenal to look at that as the icon for resilience. And I have to say, I hadn't thought of that before, but when I heard you do that analogy there between the rat initially, I couldn't help but think, and correct me if I'm wrong, that 2020 was the year of the metal rat. So That's from right. a Chinese perspective, so it's fascinating that we were we were faced with all this COVID stuff where we had to become resilient in the year of the metal rat. Do you, do you have any comment about that? And then secondly, I just want to follow that up with by saying, um, what have you seen? Because I know you talk to lots of people all around the world. What have you seen that have been sort of the, um, the one, two or three things that have lifted people out of the mindset of doom and gloom and got them back into being really resourceful again at the moment? Thank you very much. That's a very, very good question. First of all, I must um, clarify, I uh, don't subscribe to the Chinese Zodiac. Uh, but interestingly enough, like you say, the year, of the, or the year that the pandemic started was known as the year of the rest. And uh, I like to see the good in everything. I think probably, you know, the year 2020 until right now, probably is a wake up call uh, for all of us to remember that, you know, we have many values that we have somehow lost as we journey on life. You know, I always say that uh, we pursue what we call the five Ps. We pursue for profits, we pursue for pleasure, we pursue for position, we pursue power, we pursue uh, prestigious, uh, prestige and, and, uh, and uh, privileges. But finally, at the end of our life, there are many more things that are even more are more important. So probably the year of the red is to remind us that we have a lot to learn from reds, especially my last two points where I mentioned reds take care of each other, reds are sociable, reds build relationship, and reds have learned how to survive and thrive in the worst uh, possible situations. And in the same way, probably the pandemic is also uh, a, way, a wake up call to tell us we have to prepare for even more challenges ahead of us. For example, one of the biggest challenges is climate change. And I believe that climate change cannot be tackled by governments, universities, researchers, charity organizations. If climate change can be resolved, it has to be resolved by each and every one of us. 
we must come together, for example, to patronize companies that are contribution, contributing to uh, enhancing the environment, protecting the environment. We must not patronize companies that are deteriorating the environment. I think there are many things that we can do together. So when I look at the whole pandemic, I actually wrote a letter. Maybe I can get my colleague to find a letter. I actually wrote a letter to COVID-19 uh, towards the end of year 2020 because uh, in my country on April the 4th, my prime minister announced that all of us have to stay at home. So we had a temporary uh, lockdown. Now, you can imagine like many of us, you know, who went through your first uh, lockdown, my heart sank to the ground because I'm not a technology company. You know, to ask me to stay at home, to tell my colleagues to stay at home, you are virtually telling me to close down my company. But long story short, at the end of 2020, we, uh, we finished the year getting even better results than we can ever imagine. We now have more customers, more paying customers in more countries than we have ever done since the beginning uh, of, of time. So I wrote a letter uh, to, uh, to uh, dear COVID-19. Uh, I want to just read a few sentences to you with regard to your second part of your question as to what are some things that uh, you and I can do. Uh, so I started this letter by saying, dear COVID-19, you have caused angst, anxiety, and anger in many parts of the world. However, we don't see you as just a challenge, but also as an opportunity. So I went on to explain, as I've uh, shared in this uh, webinar, how you and I can always respond to changes. And in my second paragraph, I mentioned that strange but true, it took a COVID-19 to further enlighten us about the potential and possibilities of the human spirit. We have seen many people suffer through the pandemic, but I've also seen heroic examples of stories of not just individuals, of teams, of groups, of organization and enterprises that have risen up as a result of this pandemic. And I mentioned in the third paragraph, we have tried to divide and stable, destabilize us, but we have learned how to collaborate and co-create solution. If nothing else, I think we hope, I hope we begin to understand we are not of different races, different religion, different creed, custom, uh, communities or culture. Finally, we are part of the human race. If nothing else, if anything else, the COVID-19 pandemic should remind us unless and until you and I come together, put our hands together, we will never have a better future. We may even uh, zoom ahead to our final destruction. I uh, wrote in my fourth paragraph, uh, you have made us dwell on our internal world, but we leverage on our external world to network with partners to enhance contribution, advantage and growth. So in my fourth paragraph, I mentioned many things that you and I can do and I, I close this letter by saying, watch out COVID-19, we are ever ready. So I tell my friends, whatever you cannot change, you have to change yourself. Whatever problems that you cannot change, learn how to celebrate through this problem. And I mentioned to COVID-19 that I cannot change, whip it on. We will fight on to turn every battle into a victory. I'll be very happy to send this somehow to all of you uh, I have a soft copy somewhere if I can send somebody and if you're happy, you know, I hope you can distribute this letter because uh, I think this letter has, uh, is something that I wrote uh, deep from my heart, deep from my being about what I've gone through and it has inspired many of my colleagues and I hope it will inspire you at the same time. That's Thank fantastic, you. Patrick. Thank you so much. And, uh, and I definitely think, you know, if we can get the soft copy, I read that when you posted it, I can't remember when it was, but I remember reading it and I thought it was very good and, Nicola would be happy to post it on our, on our sites as well. Um, I want to go back to 20 years ago, right? So you, where your story started and um, and the tech company, and, and I didn't know you then. As I said, I think I met you for the first time in about 2007. So, um, and so that was a, a long time after that. And then you moved from that and you and Richard came up with the concept of success resources, which, as I said, became you know, the biggest and best events company on the planet and, you know, ran events around the world. I think, you know, uh, I remember talking to either you or Richard, I can't remember which one it was, you're running events in China with over 10,000 people, America, you know, in the high thousands. And then you went also into your real estate business as well and had literally thousands of agents. So from somebody who was um, really facing 
such drama 20 years ago, you, you were able to turn that into amazing success. Um, in somebody, you know, we've, all the people on this call, Patrick, are entrepreneurs. So um, some of them probably don't ever feel that they can get to the levels of success that you've had. So, you know, if you go back to those early days, what do you think were the steps or looking back, what do you think were the key elements that you used? And you've got a very strong mind, I know. Um, to really move things forward and to be able to build, take it from being a good sized business of, you know, a few staff into actually a huge business. What was that mindset, all those steps? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, first of all, let me explain to you why I want to be an entrepreneur. I believe the world, if the world is going to be changed, the world has to be changed by the fourth key or the, there must be a fourth key that must come to the table. The first key is the government, but government's hands are tight. They can't change the world on their own. The second key belongs to universities, but universities and uh, Institute of Higher Learnings are predominantly focused on cultivating knowledge. The third key is char are charity organization. They have been around for hundreds of years, uh, but they may not necessarily have the talents, the resources, the system, and other resources to change the world. I believe if the world is going to be changed, we need the fourth key. We need all of us in the private sector to put in the key before the world can be changed. So to me, being an entrepreneur is not just about making money. It's not about a, just a financial bottom line, as they say. It is also about the social bottom line, the environmental bottom line, and as, as well as the spiritual bottom line to serve a higher calling and fulfill a worthwhile cause. So many years ago, I coined a formula. I, uh, I, uh, I was inspired by uh, Albert Einstein, the most, one of the most brilliant men in the last century. Uh, he invented a theory called the law of relativity, E equals to MC squared. Uh, I call my formula for success, E equals to MC to the power of four. E is for excellence. At the end of the day, we start with an internal journey before we can pursue an external journey. The pattern for success must start from inside before you bring it outside to the real world. So you must have the spirit to want to pursue excellence. And I always tell my friends this, anything that's worth doing is worth doing with excellence and with passion and excellence. Anything worth doing is worth doing with passion and excellence. M is for mission. You have to start with a mission. And that mission must be about higher calling and a worthwhile cause, as I mentioned to you, uh, why I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And then we need a synergy of the four Cs. The first C is commitment. If you're not committed to do something, you can never achieve success in that thing. And then the second C has to do with your character. As uh, Warren Buffett said, if you hire somebody, if the person's character is wrong, nothing will ever be right. So if you have an uh, inspirational character, if you have an altruistic character, if you have a character that wants to go out there and touch people's life, you have put yourself on the starting path to become successful. And then the third C has to do with your, your competence. So whatever business you're in, whatever jobs or career you're in, you are required to have a degree of knowledge, attitude, skills, and habits that you need to develop. And this is unique to your own business, your own career, and your own situation. You, do, you need to map out what are the, these uh, factors that will help you to contribute, that will contribute to your success. And then the last C is compassion. I think the world needs more and more compassion. We need people who know how to extend care and concern to other people. So E equals to MC double to the power of four, E for excellence, M for mission, the four C's uh, refers to commitment, character, competence, and compassion. I think if you have got all these factors right, you put yourself on the right path to become successful. And that's what I commit myself to do. And if I have any success at all, the little bit of success I have is because of these principles uh, that I, uh, I subscribe to uh, from a very young age, from the beginning of my entrepreneurial journey. Fantastic answer. Philippe from Melbourne wants to ask a question. Philippe? Thank you. Uh, first, Patrick, great presentation. Thank you. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, resilience and grit. So you've been speaking a lot about resilience. I want to know what, in your expertise, what's your connection between resilience and grit, and uh, what's what's all also the difference that you that you are aware of. There is uh, there is some differences. There's a lot of common denominator. Uh, so in my humble opinion, resilience is about being able to uh, bounce back from failures. Uh, resilience is about being able to overcome setbacks. 
Uh, resilience is about being able to go through whatever challenges so that you can pursue your destination. And grit is about the whole uh, ensuing journey, about being able to start right, being able to do the right thing, including being resilient uh, to completing the race. So uh, to me, tenacity, determination, discipline, uh, and resilience is part of this uh, complete value uh, called uh, resilience. It's called grit, uh, which is you know, another webinar that will probably do if you subscribe to my YouTube channel, I have another webinar we're going to do on grit. Uh, but for the purpose of this webinar, I decided to just focus on resilience uh, because more people are interested in how to overcome the current crisis, uh, which experts have called the worst crisis of this century. But I also believe this is the greatest opportunity of an entire lifetime. I hope I've uh, defined the difference between uh, resilience and grit uh, to you. But I'm sure, yeah, you did. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure the other people may have a different definition, but uh, that's my definition. So uh, resilient is a subset of the entire uh, value, uh, value of uh, grit. Fantastic. So we're open for other questions. Please raise your hand. But whilst uh, whilst you think about that, Patrick, I, I again, I love what you say. Um, ever since I was in my 20s, I wrote um, in my diary in the front page, always turn a problem into an opportunity. And I think, you know, so many people when they face a problem and the bigger your business gets, the bigger the problems get. You know, if you look at Warren Buffett or, you know, Richard Branson or Elon Musk or any, you know, huge global names of entrepreneurs, their, their problems are, are manifested tenfold, but um, they really do become opportunities. Do you have a process that you use to when you get a problem in business to look at it from a different viewpoint so that you can find the opportunity in it. How do you view a problem? To me, problem and opportunities are two sides of the coin. You may not be able to uh, change the problem, but you can change yourself. You may not be able to change the situation, but you can rise up above the situation. You cannot change your circumstances but you can find ways and means to not only resolve the circumstances, but to go around the circumstances. If nothing else, you can learn from this setback, this failure, this situation, and all these situations and circumstances to become a stronger, more resilient and better person. One of the things that uh, I uh, get my students to do, and some of you may be interested to do this, and I'm sure you have done something like this, is to take a piece of a blank paper, and plot the high point and the low point in your life. Plot the moments when you are very, very successful and when you feel badly, the times when you are very, very happy and the times when you are very, very sad. After you have plot your life cycle, and if I ask you, at which point in your life do you learn the most? At which point in your life do you find yourself changing in the best possible way? At which point in your life you have become a much better and stronger person? And chances are most people would uh, come to this realization. It is those times when they have gone through a problem, they have faced a setback, they have gone through a failure. Uh, that's the time when they go through their major transformation to become a better person. So uh, when I was uh, a young man uh, in Sunday school class, I always remember my Sunday school teacher tell me, he quoted from this verse in the Bible from James chapter 1, verse 2. He says, count it all joy, when you fall into diverse temptation, uh, that's the uh, archaic English. What, it, what in essence it means is this, whenever there is problem, celebrate, be happy, be joyful. And at the point in time, I was thinking, hey, how can it be? I'm going through problem. Why should I celebrate? Why should I be happy? Why should I be joyful? At that point in time, I only probably understand in theory how this works, how it will shape and influence me. But now at 64 years old, after going, after going through my fair share of uh, problem, challenges, setbacks, and failures, I realized truly these are the things that make you a better person. These are things can also, that can also make you a worse person. And, uh, and so that's the reason why I say, you know, failures, setbacks, problems, and opportunities are two sides of a coin. If you see failures, setbacks, and challenges as a problem, then you will not see the opportunity. 
But if you can see the opportunity and you can see the outcomes, the outputs and impacts that can make you a better person, you will find ways to overcome these challenges and put yourself on the right track to reach your desired destination. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. You definitely have. I've got, we've got time for one last question. Thanks, Patrick. We could keep talking all day. This is from Diane from Cape Town. And uh, she's, she works with small to medium-sized business owners. She raises a lot of money for them. Um, she says, listening to your major successes, what practical opportunity do you see currently that business owners are not jumping at? I think there are some things that should change and there are some things that should not change. Uh, instead of talking about something in the, in the distant future, uh, let me suggest a few things I think we should change. First of all, is leadership transformation. I believe that all great organization depends on great leaders and great teamwork. And if you look at how every country, every enterprise, every organization has, uh, has, uh, re has responded to the pandemic. And inevitably, you will come to realize the countries, the communities, the enterprises and the organization teams that have done very, very well. You can bet your last dollar it is because they have great leaders and great teamwork. And if there's anything we can learn from this pandemic is to uh, stand in front of a mirror and spend enough time on reflection and introspection and ask yourself, how can I be a better leader? How can I build a better team? Because with great leadership and teamwork, we can overcome not just this uh, pandemic, we can overcome whatever challenges in the future, including disease X. Because experts have said, this is not going to be the first or the last pandemic. This is not going to be the first and the last virus. There could possibly be a worse one coming. Second, secondly, has to do with human capital transformation. So leadership transformation, human capital transformation. How do we look after the people around us? And the question that I think we have always asked ourselves is this, do you love people, use things, or do you love things, use people? I repeat again, do you love things, use people, or do you use, love people, use things? I think we all have got our value system wrong. You know, I, let me give you an example. You know, uh, many years ago, I had this defined appointment, you know, to go out there and love people. And so in my country, I'm an evangelist of love. Uh, I have a case study in the university where I transformed my company's business model, you know, into a love-based business model. And I tell myself this, you know, as a leader, you don't have a heart to love and serve your people. You don't, you don't deserve and qualify to be a leader. I repeat again, as a leader, if you don't have a heart to love and serve your people, you don't deserve and qualify to be a leader. So the next piece of the equation that you and I need to handle is this. How do you transform the human capital in your organization, starting with you, starting with how you love and serve your people? The third transformation that's necessary is your business model transformation. We have heard this again and again. It's almost like a cliche right now. Whatever worked in the past will not work in the future. Whatever have helped you to achieve success until today may not help you to achieve success in the future. If you keep doing the same thing as they say, you will get the same results. If you walk along the same road, you will always reach the same destination. If anything else, this pandemic, uh, can teach us is that we need to now ask ourselves not what business we're in, but what business should we really be in? What should we really do to capitalize on this fast changing landscape? And the question you and I have to ask ourselves is this, what are tomorrow's problems we need to start resolving from today? What are tomorrow's opportunities that you and I should start capitalizing upon from today? So in other words, we need to now go back to the drawing board. Nothing is sacred, you know, and ask yourself, what business should I be in? What job should I be in? What career should I develop? So that in the post-COVID-19 world, we will be able to survive and thrive in a much better world. And more importantly, to serve a higher calling and serve a worthier cause. The fourth piece of the equation is technological transformation. We all know this. It is technology that's driving the fourth industrial revolution. It is technology that's going to disrupt most of our job, career, and businesses. It is technology that's shaping and influencing the landscapes of the future. The question is this, what are you doing about technology? 
how much are you putting yourself to learn new technology? And not just learning new technology, but to keep yourself updated about changes in technology. How effective and efficient are you in implementing technological tools to help you to become more efficient, more effective, more efficacious? How are you using, using technology to shape your future? So these are the four major tectonic plates that I think you and I will have to contend with you know, if you are going to survive and thrive in a new uh, economy. Leadership transformation, human capital transformation, business, tra business model transformation, and technological transformation. I think if we can get four of these tectonic plates right, I think we will have a brighter future in the future. And together, we can make this world a much better place for all of us. And I look forward to uh, seeing this pandemic come to an end. I look at all the countries uh, of all the people represented here. These are the countries that I love. Uh, I have uh, spent great time in Australia, in Africa, in many of the countries that are represented here. So I look forward to one day meeting you face to face. I'm not, I'm an old man. Uh, I'm not quite used, you can tell by now, I still am not used to uh, doing webinar where I cannot touch and feel uh, a human. So I look forward to seeing all of you face to face. And then together we can learn, improve, and get better results and achieve greater good. Thank you. Dr. Patrick Liu, in typical style, finishes his talk with much humility. And there he sits at age 64, and he hasn't got a gray hair on his head, and his head's full of hair. So you have got a lucky streak, my friend. You're getting lots of claps from everybody out there. Personally, I want to thank you so much for, for, for being on the call today. The insights were brilliant as usual, and I think everybody will know that, and um, people will go back and watch the recording as well. So uh, we've got love hearts coming up from people, so obviously uh, very well thought of, Patrick. Patrick, thanks so much. We really appreciate you, and we'll see everybody later. Thank you so much. Thank you. I love you, everybody. Patrick. Great job. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick.